Well, welcome everyone to another Aperio, Open Aperio 2020 session. Uh, this is Wednesday, June 17th, 2020, and my name is Dave Eveland, and I'll be moderating this 950 session uh, over SUGI update progress toward the NGDLE. Before we begin, I'll just go over a few housekeeping details. This session is being recorded. Uh, you will receive an email announcement once the recordings are available later. If you have any questions or comments throughout the session, uh, please type them into the chat area. Or if you have a microphone, feel free to ask your questions or make comments aloud during the Q&A part of the session. However, um, we do ask that you mute yourself, and it seems like just everybody is, if you're not speaking in order to un avoid unnecessary background noise. The presenter for the session is Dr. Chuck Severance, also known as Dr. Chuck to many, uh, and uh, really doesn't need much of an introduction. So uh, Dr. Chuck, I'm going to go ahead and make you a co-presenter, if that's okay, and uh, go ahead and take it away. So are you still sharing your screen? I'm going to stop share. Okay, there we go. Well, hello everybody and welcome to the uh, extended edition of the, the June 2020 SUGI uh, show. Um, I, it's fun for me to do the SUGI thing and then watch Wilma Hodges do <laughs> the Sakai thing because she's just so much better at doing the Sakai thing than I am. I'm, we're, we're talking last night on the patio and I'm like, I'm a Sakai programmer. I, I code LTI, it's what I do. Everyone else does so many things in Sakai and so I'm, I mean, I'm into Sakai marketing, of course. So, um, so welcome to this. Uh, I hope to be done in time to have uh, at least five to eight minutes of questions. Um, Dr. Jeff, we can't see your camera. Oh, you? We can't see um, you. Or if you have your camera on. Huh. Well, that's okay. Then I will just share my screen and that'll be that. Okay. So that was a, it was an awesome, uh, it was on uh, okay so you're seeing my go. screen now yep, yeah we can see it. so something's wrong with my camera so i don't know what to tell you sorry about that so let's share the screen now do you see the screen full, full screen dave yes that's good full screen. okay so welcome to uh sugi Pro progress toward the ngdle talk um the uh the truly most important thing to talk about is the sakai racing team and uh, we have a Sakai Racing Team uh, event, uh, even in the post-COVID environment, uh, June 27th to 28th. And if you follow me on Twitter uh, will, or on Facebook, uh, uh, I will do some live stuff from it. Um, I've had pretty good luck uh, streaming even live 360 video while I'm driving. Um, so that's kind of fun. Um, the problem is, is I got three race cars and uh, only one of them is running. The slowest of the three race cars is running. So everyone is like scrambling to get a race car going. Uh, you know, it's a week from now and I, I only, two of my three race cars aren't working. Only the slow ones working. So, but that's not the case for my Sugi servers. My Sugi servers, I've got like 15 of them and I have this automated uh, monitoring system. And, you know, this time last year, if you looked at this slide from my talk, there was little bits of orange here and there. Now, I mean, these servers, knock on wood, just take no effort on my part. They automatically upgrade themselves. They automatically fix their databases. They're totally cloud. Um, and there's Sugi servers around the world that I don't even know about that are doing the exact same thing. So Sugi is like the most cloud, cloud, cloud thing ever. Sugi, of course, is to me, the center of the kind of innovation that we need to build the NGDLE. We got to move beyond any particular LMS because each of these LMSs, including Sakai, has its speed, has its velocity. And that velocity is slow because it's, it should be slow because learning management systems need to be basically the institutional record, not the crazy idea that a faculty member came up with yesterday. And, and to change the, to change the LMS every single day is a disaster, even if you could do that. That'd be unstable, et cetera. But we need something that can uh, give us this innovation and make it so that every little piece is kind of separate and you can upgrade different pieces at different rates, et cetera. Sugi basically uh, gives us, um, I gotta hide that. Sugi basically gives us a lot of things. It's a development framework. It helps with standards compliance. It helps people write tools and 
and comply with Google Classroom without even knowing it, but it's also software that's for hosting and it gives us a learning app store. And then along with uh, Sugi's Koseya project sort of lives in the shadow of Sugi, but it's, it's my DIY publishing uh, effort and learning object repository. And it's, it is really a MOOC hosting platform in a way it's a competitor to open edX um, in that respect. And so, um, so if you look at the code vector, um, the, the interesting thing is, is that uh, I am the number one committer followed by Anthony and Noah, but uh, it, it doesn't take too many commits to end up in the leaderboard of Sugi. I don't think this is a bad thing. There is something nice about a project that has, it's all in one person's mind. Um, Sugi is small enough to fit in my mind. It is not difficult for me to fix it, to respond to bugs. Um, and part of it is Sugi is small and self-contained and, and elegant and carefully built inside. And it's not painful for one person to do it on a totally part-time basis. Um, the thing that, that I've done uh, most recently that's quite exciting is made it so people can do Sugi hosting because of the stability of Sugi. We're, I'm now at the point where people are saying, you know, I just want to run it. I mean, I, I don't want to come to a Sugi talk and hear that you're like working on it. Like it should be done. It's like Apache. Like you don't go to Apache and go like, uh, how close to done is Apache? You don't, you're not interested in that. You're not interested in here's our 12 new features. It just needs to run in production. And I have spent uh, just in the last month or so a ton of time not, I've been running production for a long time, certainly been working very hard for over a year on building, making production easy for me, but now I'm making production easy for everybody else. I've got an Amazon AMI image that if you really want to, I learned this from Blackboard when I worked at Blackboard. Blackboard, you can subscribe to an image that they change every quarter. And they're like, do you want the new one? And then they just push you a new image. This image here, it's actually auto updating. And so you don't even need to get new ones unless you need a different version of PHP or something. So the AMI setup for Sugi is really easy and you don't even have to run a script. You basically just say, start with Chuck's gold standard, the one I use for my own Sugi servers, and then in effect, fork that to make your EC2 server and then hook in things like databases, et cetera. A big part a couple of years ago of Sugi was to realize that I got to get these tools in front of people, not just libraries, but tools. And so sugicloud.org is uh, basically funded by my company learning experience. And it's a free hosted app store for education. People use it in Google Classroom and Canvas, Sakai, all over the planet. So the thing that's exciting, and you can go to sugicloud.org and look at the app store, is the number of tools that really have appeared on this app store in the last 12 months. And some of these tools came from me and some of these tools came from others. And that's cool. Uh, uh, Dave Bauer, of course, is a, we could just rename him asterisk almost, he's almost all the asterisks are uh, Dave Bauer and uh, Dayton. Um, so he has done a bunch of, of work. He's probably the second biggest contributor to Sugi and certainly uh, the, almost the largest contributor to Sugi tools at this point, but building lots of tools this is what's going to get Sugi attractive. Myself, I built a couple of tools. I mentioned this in the other talk. I built a PDF annotator with sticky notes that has a workflow that moves between teachers and learners. Um, I was asked uh, separately afterwards whether or not I thought that we should not do annotation in Sakai and instead just use a Sugi tool. And my answer to that is no. Annotation is not that hard. There, we could do simple basic annotation and look at the code that I've built in these annotation systems and say, you know what, that's really easy. Just follow the exact patterns, build web services, build Ajax, build the thing that I built, be compatible with it, but then go put like 75 lines of code into Sakai, right? So I've figured out how to use this, but that doesn't mean that you should not, we should not add this to Sakai. So I think we could add uh, both PDF annotation and HTML annotation into Sakai. Uh, without too much effort, actually. And it's probably better than saying uh, everything is external. Although, when I add uh, LTI launches into the assignments tool, <laughs> which will be a Sakai 21 feature, by the way, uh, when I add LTI uh, launches from assignments tool, maybe we won't, we won't care. And maybe we'll just use Sugi tools out of assignments. We'll see, we'll see. Um, 
So another uh, really important contribution this year came from uh, David Bauer. Uh, David Bauer has uh, eternally been frustrated by my uh, lack of design skills and he just fixes everything, which is exactly what an open source project should work. I do it, it works, it functions, and David's like, that's ugly and I'm gonna fix it. So this David UI is designed so that tools can live in iframes and you kind of don't know where one starts and one stops. And so if you're smart, you can figure out what part of this screen is Sakai and what part of this is Sugi, but it doesn't look ugly and it doesn't look ugly in Canvas in an iframe and it doesn't look ugly in Desire to Learn in an iframe. But there is one thing that the astute viewer might notice and that is the colors aren't identical. The colors aren't identical. There are some blues and there are some grays, but the blues are a little different between the outside and the inside. I think the no border stuff, the kind of really understated menu that Dave came up with is outstanding. It doesn't detract from the other. There's at least three pieces of navigation on the screen other than Sugi. And so, and they're calling attention to themselves from a UI UX perspective. And the Sugi one is just like, of course, that's all these tools have things inside them. And so now you can't really tell the difference between inside tool. But when SAC 42272 is done, these colors, the colors outside, will be communicated to inside. So this blue will be that blue, and this gray will be that gray. And Dave did a great job of really simplifying theming inside of Sugi tools. And so I want this to eventually become an IMS standard so that we can send four or five colors from any LMS so that Canvas, Desire to Learn, Blackboard can send colors to Sugi tools as well and then other LTI tools as well. So to me, this is a really important thing, just, just every little detail of making that beautiful, that, that connection between LMSs and tools. I want that to be as beautiful as it can be to the point where we just don't notice. So the Premier Q8 site, for Tsugi is Python for everybody. I eat my own dog food. When a master commit goes in, within 30 minutes, it's running in production, and it's running in production in a gigantic server. So we have my Coursera class. This data has actually been cut down by two thirds recently because things just got too big. But you see like 4 million logins, and my one course, these are all my courses. And some are Coursera, some are edX, some are FutureLearn, some are just people randomly using this stuff. But this is a highly scalable and performance system. This runs on a Amazon EC2 T2 small. That is one megabyte of memory runs this. And it actually, I finally found out how many users makes Tsugi slow down. And it was over a half a million in one class. Over half a million users in one class, Tsugi began to slow down. Turns out that the only thing that slowed down in Tsugi was the instructor grade detail interface. The students never slowed down, even at a half a million users in one course. Tsugi never slowed down, never even, the server was actually bored when it was starting to see performance problems. The database was bored. What happened was, is the instructor, when they're like sorting based on a half a million students and stuff, it just had to look at too much data and it just took too much time, no matter how well it was indexed. A half a million students turns out to be non-trivial. But that had to do with a very specialized auto grader interface that I had built that had a lot of data and a lot of data in JSON and it slowed down after half a million students on a tiny, tiny thing. I would say this part of Sugi is by far uh, my most proud moment. Um, oh, I know why my, my, I know why my speaker wasn't working. My thing wasn't working. Um, this is my most proud moment in, um, this will be better. Oop. Dr. Chuck, we got about 15 more minutes. Okay. Hey, we can see you now. This is great. Yeah. Sorry about that. Sorry about that. Can you hear me? Too? Can you hear me also? Yes. Okay. So I, I just had to plug something in. Um, so this is my most proud slide. This is something I've been building since the day I started Sugi, and that is 
you can go into the administer interspace and you can expire data. You can expire learning activity data, you can expire personal identifiable information data, and you just click it and the data vanishes and nothing is harmed. Um, the Django part, I've been working on the Django. Uh, LTI2 is gone. Uh, the Django uses a really cool uh, Java Web Token launch and RPC API. I have been improving the Django code uh, and putting it into production. I still have, don't have a good formula for building a scalable Django server farm. I have a wonderful formula for building a scalable PHP farm, um, but I don't have one for Django yet. I mean, I can put up a box and run Django on it, but then when that box runs out of juice, I don't know what to do next. So um, Django is, Django's awesome, but it's still a little toyish. Uh, compared to PHP. I mean, it's, it's a great development environment, but it's a little toyish. So using Django to force me, um, I've got a grad student working for me this summer to build the New York University uh, three-headed monster discussion tool, which they've only built part at New York University. There's a Sakai tool that only has one of these done. And so we could, we could spend money and finish it in Sakai, or I'm just going to build it in Sugi. And this is Stephanie and she's working and she's been working on it for two weeks and I'm starting to see some really good work in our regular meetings. And uh, so I'm hopeful that we will have a really amazing discussion tool by fall that lives in Sugi that will uh, perhaps in its first instance be better than any discussion tool in any LMS that we've ever seen. So as I have moved over the last two years to trying to make Django development in Sugi a real thing, and it's, it's real, but, it, 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 but, but Stephanie's work is gonna stress me even more and make me work even harder, and that's okay. Um, I have been working on a new MOOC, which the idea that I will train a couple million Django developers that will be coming out on Coursera in July 22nd, and it will come out on edX shortly thereafter. This will literally be the first specialization in the world ever built and deployed on all three major MOOC platforms uh, at the same time. And uh, Sugi is what made that happen. Another thing that, that I've been doing is um, building, in a sense, a publisher backend. And this is a screenshot that, of a really lousy user interface called edX. But what you'll notice in here is um, it's all Spanish. And so we are pretty much the only Python course to the Spanish speaking world that doesn't want to take their course in um, Spanish. We have a complete translation. You'll notice the URL is es.py4e.com. Literally every word in this UI has now been translated. And so this website is all Spanish. They renamed the PowerPoint files from tuples to tuple -la -la or whatever, right? Um, and so this is amazing. Of course, the supporting materials, and this is the Sugi side of it. Um, people can use this as an open education resource site. It also plugs into Coursera and supports my Spanish site. And the book. I have a book publishing mechanism that is translatable. Python for everybody is now oops, Python for everybody is now in uh, four languages that are free with print books: um, Portuguese, Italian, and Spanish. I believe are the are the translations. And we're working on an Italian uh, website. And um, and I'm getting increasing interest in this really ugly, nasty, nasty backend process that makes all that translation and publishing possible. Um, this is how I have built the world's most popular element, uh, world's most popular uh, MOOC, but this is too hard. Um, if you've ever worked at a publisher, you know that publisher backends are not all that great. They're often like weird Perl scripts that people just use. And Sarah is the one who knows how to get the cover updated of all the O'Reilly books and because she's the one that knows how to run the Pearl thing. Um, and so I, I'm getting increasing interest in people that want to use this. So I'm going to try to make Koseyu a much more usable piece of software in the next 12 months. And Dr. Um, Chuck. Yes. Dr. Chuck, I see we have 11 minutes left, and uh, there are some compelling questions still to I'm gonna, go through. I've got two more slides. Very good. Yeah. 
I plan for that. Thank you, Laura. Okay. Yep. So here are some URLs. Sweet. And now it's time for questions. But what I'm going to leave up for the questions is the two slides that I think are the most important of this talk. First is Sugi is the world's best uh, tool for privacy. Um, it is better than any other LTI tool on the planet at handling private data. Um, and the uh, my new found obsession with building Sugi tools rather than just building Sugi. So now I will stop and let's hit the questions. So Dr. Chuck, there's a, there, there was a, an interesting question at the very beginning sort of uh, that was basically meant to ask the question, what, what is Sugi? Um, I'm not sure if you can, I mean, I think you've sort of explained some of those, but maybe to someone that might be a faculty member, what would you explain? How would you sort of explain what Sugi is? <laughs> so, so when I'm sitting and talking to a faculty member, I, I ask faculty members what they want, and then I tell them something that says Sugi is that. Um, and, and so at its simplest, Sugi is a way to develop LTI compliant applications and deploy them and plug them into LMS as fast. Full stop. I, I like but, that. But, <laughs> right. And so, and so, and so literally I, I, I have, I have changed the, the, the quick speech of Sugi to be that for a long time, but now, you know, I'm getting interest in this other part, which is this publisher workflow, which I call Koseyu. So, so is Sugi and Koseyu, Koseyu envelops Sugi, but Sugi can be used by itself. I mean, Sugi at its most simple, there are people, I believe like Zerte, that just use the Sugi library, not the Sugi UI at all, if I'm not mistaken. And so Sugi is a lot of things, but the core thing that it is, is a way to build and deploy learning applications quickly. Okay. Um, someone, I think it was Anne-Marie, uh, had mentioned in the comments that she thought that a way to describe Sugi was an app store framework and development environment for LTI tools. I Absolutely. It actually applies really well. I love it. <clears throat> Fantastic. Yep. Um, Anne-Marie actually also asked the question about um, who gets to click that magic PII button? Um, who would you imagine actually gets to select that? Oh, that's a really good question. Um, so, it, so every Sugi server has an admin UI. And so if you were in Sakai, you'd go to the administration workspace and there'd be a tool called throwaway data tool. And so that's just another tool in the administration workspace. If you want, I can actually show you in action. Do we have time? Fine. Uh, I think we have time. Get out. Come on. Come on, PowerPoint, go away. As okay. others have questions, feel free to offer them. Yeah, fire, fire away, but I will, sh I will expire some data live. Hang on. Let's do it live. My question had to do with uh, third party vendors such as uh, pu publishers and others who, um, okay, I'll say it, irritatingly enough, do not have uh, IMS Global LTI spec. Uh, they, um, they need to build that, that piece. And yeah. I sometimes say to them, why don't you use the Tsugi framework? It's already been developed for you. It's open source. You can use that to integrate your app with LMSs everywhere. Would, so, you, say, would you say that's a, a good strategy or should I be using a different strategy with third party um, commercial vendors? Um, no, yes, and maybe. <laughs> Talk to us. So, yeah. Um, so, um, <clears throat> so if the answer is PHP, then Sugi has a l several libraries that are very useful. And that's why Zerta uses a PHP library. Um, and so it's, it's good. The, the next problem that usually happens is that these LTI vendors, even if they are PHP, um, they are foolishly based on a data model that includes the user's email as their primary key for everything in the system and Sugi does not. And so if they would use Sugi and then they would have to like wean themselves off of uh, email as primary key. And most of these little stupid companies uh, were written by a little startup and everybody in a startup, their first table they put in the database is users and they make the primary key a thousand character string that's an email. 
and then they build every bit of their application on that structure. And that's horrible. And so to use Sugi right, you got to let go of the email address. And so they don't, so you're, when you say use Sugi, you're telling them to let go of the email address. And that's the bigger problem. And we need to so, do that. We need to do that anyway to come up to IMS Global Spec, don't we? They need to be for, using a different field. Yeah. So let's hold that to my lightning talk. Let's we'll that to do. My lightning talk. We'll do. Yeah. Um, another question somebody asked was, "What's the biggest challenge for Sugi in the COVID nineteen pandemic days?" Um, well, I'll tell you. I'll tell you my COVID-19 Sugi story, right? Um, I think the biggest challenge really for the world is they're not using it yet. So the, every one of the tools that I've built now, I now sit as a lurker in my own faculty meetings. And when someone is whining about COVID and they're like, I really teach this way in the real world and I can't teach online because I can't review student draft presentations, which are in PowerPoint or Google Slides and comment on them because that's a big thing I do in my office and whatever. And so she says that and I'm like, huh, maybe I'll go write me a PDF sticky note thing because she happens to like sticky notes. And, and then I say, Kristen, Kristen, I just spent a week and I made a PDF sticky note thing. Can you use it? And she's like, thanks a lot. And so I look at COVID as um, it is a moment where faculty requirements are going to come to the surface that would have never happened. And Canvas and Sakai cannot respond to that, but Sugi can. And so this is part of why COVID is part of why I'm into tools all of a sudden. Because I'm just sitting in these faculty meetings and like, oh, that would be really a cool thing to do. And so I think that's what all our schools should be doing right now. And that is listening to the faculty and not saying, oh, well, you gotta use Samago because it's the only thing we got, right? You gotta do this, you gotta do that, gotta do whatever, right? And so I, I would, we're, we're going to hear faculty requirements, but we're only gonna hear them once. If we slap them down and tell them you gotta use the LMS, they're not gonna come back and tell us those requirements again. So I'm listening carefully for requirements of what the NGDLE really should be. Hmm. Because for the first time, faculty are actually like, I can't do this. And I'm like, oh, thank you so much for that little piece of information. And so the kinds of things that I want to build are like, uh, we got a, a, a fellow who teaches a, a, a crisis informatics about like how data is used when you are Puerto Rico and get hit by a hurricane. And boy, he wants a scenario-based learning kind of a system. But it's, and so I haven't built anything like that. But one of these days, I'm just going to wander into his office or like his Zoom room and just say, hey, Ed, let's build a scenario thing. Tell me what you need. So I think that's the that's the COVID thing. We got one minute, so let me okay. just show you how sure. to inspire data. Okay. Okay. So this is the admin console. This is the same as the Kai uh, admin tool, manage data expiry. So I got 39 users, and uh, there's 2,000 users that haven't had that have personal identifiable information in the server and have no activity, and I just click this button, boop. And then, boop. Now it doesn't do all 1900, but now we only have 959 users that have PII, and if I hit this button again, boop, boop. Now, there are no users with uh, PII that's older than 150, and this is a production server, right? And I can throw user data away after 400 days by clicking this. Now this won't get as much, I mean, these all have limits on it. So it's not really, it's only gonna get rid of a hundred, but boom, it did it. And this system, so that, that would be just something you would do in this system. And you just, it's just part of the admin UI and you can add an LTI key. You can see all the classes that are using your thing. You know, that's what the admin UI is, the expiry of data. Now there's also, there's also a cron. Uh, there's also a uh, a cron version of that where you can uh, just have it run every night and throw data away up to a, a configurable. That how many days that was is all configuration. 
Well, thank you very much, Chuck. We appreciate that. There were some other questions that came in um, uh, in the chat. Uh, I don't know if we want to take time to handle those. I know that um, folks need to be getting to other sessions and everything else. Thank you so much for everyone attending. Um, if you want to hang around for a few for a few more minutes, that's fine. Um, I'll hang around. Uh, uh, yeah, there were some questions about someone asking about off O uh, for uh, uh, Django farm handling. I know that question about uh, how experienced people need to be uh, in order to do the kind of thing that University of Dayton has been able to do um, with developing Suki tools. Um, yeah, so uh, to answer Michael's question, um, I think find things like Auth0 uh, exceedingly wretched. Um, because what they really are doing is uh, solving the simplest part of the problem and then um, solve the simplest part of the problem and then telling you what you're not allowed to do. Uh, the code to handle JWTs and OAuth 2, that's pretty simple code. There's PHP libraries, there's Java libraries. And if I've got to outsource all the private information to Auth0 and have the whole university use Auth0, I'm like, screw that. I mean, you know, these folks who are trying to get their hands on our stuff are giving us the simplest, the easiest thing, like single sign-on, right? Oh, I'll do single sign-on for you. Yeah, well, that turns out to be the simplest damn thing on most campuses. And so, sorry, I don't, I mean, if Auth0 is a library, fine, I already have a library. That's not the problem. If Auth0 is some key management thing, I used to be scared of key management, but I'm not anymore. I wrote a bunch of utility code and it's really cool and I have really good unit tests for that utility code. So I, I find any outsourcing of anything that's important and authorization is the most important thing. So Michael, you can, I mean, I know you're a smart guy, so maybe I misunderstood your question. <laughs> so um, Lucy's asking how, how Dayton happened. Um, you know, I, I'll tell you how Dayton happened. Uh, Dayton happened because, I forget her name, one instructional designer uh, knew PHP. Dave, if you're, if you're on, you can shout out her name. She knew PHP. She, she, she gave a talk at, a, I think it was the Baltimore conference, and she built five tools. These tools were wretched in their implementation. They, their UI was pretty wretched too, but their pedagogy was perfect. <laughs> their pedagogy was perfect, meaning that she was thinking from an instructional designer's perspective and she was like, that's what you need. You need a Likert gadget. So she made a Likert gadget. Didn't have a lot of flexibility. She just made a Likert gadget. And, and this became popular, right? And so then she built a Likert gadget and then other people use the Likert gadget. And then what happened is as the broader IT organization became more and more aware of what was going on here, there was like, you know, we ought to do this a little more professionally. Let's not just force her to do all the work. She's like running a server under her desk or where, I don't know where it was, but it was just like a quickie server that she'd put up. And Dave, you can give an alternate version of this if you want, because this is the way I saw it happen. Um, Dave Bauer. Um, and then the IT folks are like, we can do this. And then the IT folks did like a UI redesign. They, they uh, I think it was most of fall of last year, they went through Sugi and like, gotta fix that, gotta fix that. Here's our tools, let's standardize on how we do it. Um, Cause the original person who did all that work, um, she, uh, um, yeah, the original person that did all that work, uh, you know, she, she had just built each tool without a consideration of where the menu goes or where everything goes. And as the IT organization began to sort of take this role on rather than just have it be a instructional designer, they like standardized it. And then they standardized it for everybody. And, and so the, the part that I take away from this story, um, well, compare and contrast that to the University of Michigan. We've got seven, places that might purport to want to do innovative teaching and learning on our university. I won't name them because I don't want to shame them. Um, but literally, if you went to any of them and you said, all I need is a Likert scale, they'd be like, ah, how about analytics? I'm like, no, I just want a damn Likert scale. And so 
all these organizations that purport to innovating on behalf of the faculty, they actually start out innovating and they quickly put themselves in this kind of defensive cocoon that says, this is inside of our world, we defend it fiercely, we're not gonna get outside our comfort zone and we're just gonna work. And so the woman whose name I'm still not getting, um, she, she wasn't part of that. She just wanted to get something done and she was allowed to do it. And, and so I don't know. And I've been waiting for those organizations in the University of Michigan that, I, that, that spend more time defining their boundaries than actually uh, doing things outside their boundaries. I've been waiting for them and I've decided that I'm just gonna start writing the damn tools. They, these folks who are purport to be our innovators on campus don't, not, at least not in software. They don't wanna to listen to faculty requirements. They do wanna get grants for some stupid effing advanced analytics thing. And they do wanna go write papers at the stupid effing LAC conference, but they don't wanna to listen to faculty at all. They wanna tell faculty and then they wanna study faculty and then they wanna write papers. And it's okay, right? It's okay to do that. That's not bad. It just, we're lucky that Dayton just lucked into the right structure, so. Power to the people. Yes, Lucy, yeah. you're absolutely right. It is power to the people. You know, it's, it's, and I, and, and, and Lucy, you know, if I, if I, long-term dream, right, and I talked about this last year and the year before, is to graduate 100,000 Django developers and then show people how to write tools in Django. And maybe with those kinds of numbers, then I can get to the point where this will actually hook, right? This will hook somewhere. Um, and so that's my long-term hope. But in the short term, I've got to get to get schools and IT organizations interested. I got to make installation easy. And when you get installed, you have 30 or 40 tools that just start and that'll wake people up and that'll get people started. And then they can come to innovation later. And so that was, that was my mistake for five years is I'm like, I want to make a thing that allows people to innovate. And then they're like, I don't want to do that. It's outside my comfort zone. If I make it so it's installing software, and they get benefit from that software install instantaneously, then life's a lot better, I think. Dr. Chuck, thank you so much. I hate to cut you off. Um, yeah, yeah, we should uh, cut off. We've got to get going. Thank you all so very much for attending, and we'll see you in the next couple of sessions. Yeah.